Welcome to the Screw Line 2012 Fire Toss. Um, thank God they have this blue metal mic so I don't have to use this metal thing. Um, my name's Rex. Uh, I run a website, you know, the AFSEC portal, with a few folks here that help out Matthew and me. And there's some other discussion going on. Okay, this is what Fire Toss is. I mean, normally people get 45 minutes to an hour to talk. So the idea of fire talks is to you know, force the speakers to cut out all the fluff and get straight to the point. And, and that simply uh, is what fire talks is. Um, I just want to thank, we have some awesome sponsors, some great prizes. We have three judges. Um, who's the judge? John. Where's John? He left. Oh, Luna. He left. He left. Okay. That bastard. Alright, the, the, the judges suck. I mean, I'm here. Alright, oh, okay. He sent me from me. Put your glasses right. on, man. Oh. Alright, so we have John, we have. Soap Turtle. Soap Turtle. And. Rogue Clown. Rogue Clown. Okay. Thank you for judging. So what they're going to do is they're going to look at each of the talks, and they're going to rate the talks from 1 to 10. And at the end of two nights, we're going to add them up. And whoever the winner is gets, and Jack, you can kind of jump up and down with this. This is my Vanna White. No wonder he got the like, sexiest info set guy. Woo hoo! So, and guess give us some love. <laughs> and there's one more thing. What is that? It's an iPod to control a bunch. To control your AR drone, <laughs> Rocklocopter, whatever it is. And that, as well as some swag, is brought to you by Milton Security Group. So just want to give a big thanks for them. Woohoo! <laughs> then we have a trio of smaller companies. Uh, there's the, Le the Leverage Group, um, Lars. Lars. And uh, dirty the dirty second, yes. Yeah. All right. Dirty sec tour twenty. Anyway, so once again for second place, I don't know. I think the last year we had a netbook as first place, but guess what? We got something more awesome, and so now the netbook is second place, and it's being used by my friend Judy here. Come on, hold up. She's taking notes on it because she's right here. Here, so. <laughs> Third place is finally. Brought to you by one of my favorite blocks, Liquid Matrix Security Digest. Yeah. Oh, and once again, you get an iPad. Mm -hmm. Touch. iPad You wish. An iPod Touch. <laughs> so, I've put in a little bit of work here, but there's been a lot of folks made it a lot easier over the past month. And so I just want to give a big shout out to all of them. We have Jack, Jack Daniel standing to my right. Uh, he helped with sponsorship, the reviewing all the submissions, as well as the, the uh, he's helping out with the time this e evening. We have Sarah Clark, who is a new contributor to know the Infosec portal. Raise your hand. Hi. She's back there. Um, she's going to be doing, she's kind of like the newsy person, she, she's, she's going to be tweeting and blogging and stuff, so we'll get this out there. Uh, she also helped with review all the paper submissions. We have Jason Oliver, who's not here tonight because he sucks. <laughs> yeah, I actually, he, he just got in late from a business trip, but yeah. anyway, he also helped review some of the papers. We have Dr. Huna, who is the judge, and and unfortunately, it is, but you knew this is getting credit for being a judge too, and uh, looks like we got to add a few more names there too. <laughs> um, and then Georgia and Adrian, who are both doing the streaming and recording of the five talks. Thank you. Uh, is Boris here? All right. All right. Well. Yep. Okay. Who's that wishing back? Security. Thank you. Anyway. We, we got a few people working security. We have Nathy, we have also Casey, Casey Dunham. So um, there may be a few people that I missed there because in the commotion of the last minute, things have kind of got switched. So tomorrow night will be much better. 
Uh, this is the schedule for this evening. Myself, uh, David Zendian, is he here? Yeah, so we're going to swap him out with one of the alternate talks, which is going to be Thomas Malficker, and he's going to be talking about inside your cabinet, a simple alarm using the oh, excuse me, exploding PDF for head testers. Uh, and then next we're going to have Chris John Riley talking about uh, SAP. Uh, Pedro is going to be talking about uh, Router Phone, a cool, a, cool, a cool little tool that he wrote. We have Michelle who's going to be giving us a very interesting, uh, she's, she's, she's going to be stretching our minds some, let's put it that way. Uh, and then we have Mr. Perez Nadie, who uh, is going to be talking about five ways that we're killing our own privacy. So um, that's all I have. And without further ado, I'm going to start with the first talk. See if I have a power spot. Your power cord for it. It's USB. So again, disclaimer, I'm only speaking for myself. I provided, uh, I've left the government service now, but you know, there may still be some lingering things there. Um, I'll mention that a little bit later. And I've done some really good public documentation on the SIPA and smart card. So if there's a hint on what to Google for, and it's like the first four hits, uh, give you PDFs to talk about it. So this is basically the history of my bio. Um, if you're really interested in reading all that, just watch the uh, video and then pause that slide. So we got the buyer and the disclaimer uh, out of the way. Uh, next, we'll talk about some recon, what you can find out there, and then we'll give you some real world examples, some screenshots. Um, for the Derby Con talk, I had like 150 slides. <laughs> um, so the normal recon that you do as part of any pen test, um, a lot of that information is going to be used um, for your mapping of the PKI infrastructure. What you want to look for is you want to look for internet websites, you want to look for stuff like employee portals, um, timekeeping systems, and OWA is probably one of the most popular ones. So you look at those SSL certificates, get the CRL, the certificate revocation download site, and then you can uh, you know, get the supported uh, protocols from that. Usually it's LDAP or HTTP. You can take these CRLs and then basically convert them to a human readable format. Um, in my other presentation, there's a slide in there what uh, basically the command line that SANS uh, Storm Center used for the, um, when the uh, uh, Komodo, I think it was, when their uh, certificates got compromised. So, um, you got to find a way to obtain the public PKI certificates, obviously the public websites. Uh, those certificates will be easy to find. Um, again, look for those that are on their internal network. And then what you'll want to look for is look at the common names. The common names in the certificates most likely will match DNS. Um, they should. And then a lot of times you'll find PKI certificates where you'll see the common name and it doesn't resolve in DNS. So what you started to do there is look at their internal uh, PKI infrastructure. And their DNS infrastructure may be split, but that doesn't necessarily mean that their uh, PKI infrastructure is split in the same way. And of course, most of the internal PKI infrastructure for most organizations is going to be Microsoft Active Directory. So you'll also want to do the same thing for um, looking for email public certificates. You can find those in Google. Um, some of the public mailing list archives are also good places to look. They don't strip those off. Um, another great place to look for, and a good practical example of this, is the HP Gary Compromise by Anonymous, the email school for that had lots of people um, that had said, signed emails to their support organization 
wanting to get new license keys. Um, even though HP Gary didn't have a capability for doing encrypted email, they signed those emails anyway, so they had basically put their uh, public certificate out there. So the people that send those emails are probably not going to be your average Joe user in those organizations. They're going to be people that are instant responders, guys that do computer forensics. So uh, if you've been watching the whole Bradley Manning uh, hearing up in Fort uh, Meade, there's people from what's called RBCCI, the Computer Crimes Investigation uh, Unit, and I've actually gone through the HP Gary, and I've seen lots of people um, that are connected, let's say, with the DOD in the uh, cybercrime uh, field. Um, and it's like, yep, know that guy, know that guy, know that guy. So if you're going to utilize that uh, signature, you can also um, send them an email that you know because you're going to encrypt it with their, private, with their public key, which they can only read because they have the private key. So the problem with that is, is you also need to have a PKI certificate that you can encrypt email, which is not a problem because you can get one of those for free. Um, the URL there is, is va uh, valid, and you can also revoke the certificate. The certificate itself is valid for an entire year. Um, I showed in the core <coughs> talk where you can basically send an email to uh, another address, and uh, you know it opens, it looks legitimate. Um, if you want to further uh, basically sign the email with a certificate that doesn't match the actual email address, there's a way you can do that in Gmail uh, with an add-on. It doesn't work in Outlook, uh, unfortunately. So why would you want to encrypt that phishing email? Well, the reason is fairly simple. Um, you bypass the email scanning that happens on the server uh, because that's encrypted, so they can look at the header, they can look at the, you know, the subject of the email but not the body. In addition, um, the only way that an email anti-spam gateway uh, antivirus could look at that email and decrypt it is if they had a recovery key. So for an organization, you would have to have a, like almost a master type recovery key so you can decrypt all that. And there's probably not a high likelihood that an organization would trust somebody with like a master key, the keys to the kingdom, to put on a, a box to basically decrypt everyone's email that's coming in. So, also looking, if you're looking uh, for the actual PCAT infrastructure or sites that describe their infrastructure, um, you Google for terms like PKI, CRL, or OCSP. Um, you use the Google uh, operators to uh, minimize your results that you get back. Uh, one of the interesting operators is the site operator. Uh, and, uh, you know, I have found some sites where, you know, they put all their stuff on pki.foo.com. And it's like, you know, it'd be great if I could use a wild card to search in there. And, uh, you know, because I don't want to, you know, go through all the domains or all, let's say, the top level domains or what that I know. So the good news is it does work. So you can actually go out there and put wild cards in the Google site operator. I actually looked at the Google um, help and they didn't actually say that the wild cards were uh, valid for use. And when I started doing these, I had my first experience of Google thinking I was a bot and I had to do uh, fill out the CAPTCHA. Um, also works, you can uh, you know, add stuff together with the regular type of uh, regex uh, expressions. Uh, so this is the result that you uh, basically search out for uh, com. Um, the actual interesting thing here is circled in red, you have the um, you know, Google response back there, you know, advertisement, and uh, you know, they have in there the wildcard and if you own that domain. Um, I, that this is probably not a function that's intended to be there, or maybe not even known, and or their routine for the ads doesn't compensate for that. And um, the actual first hit is a false positive because it's a website that uh, produces software for PKI. And as you can see here, you go down, you've got uh, you know PKI certificates for Honeywell employees, uh, some banks, um, and uh, you know ING corporate you know certificates. If you do it for .gov, you start out with people like the Nuclear, uh, uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission, uh, the Treasury Department, uh, and actually the Treasury Department <coughs> provides services, uh, outsourced services for other government organizations. Uh, you know, for instance, they also provide services to some parts of the Department of Justice. 
So a good project if you're wanting to look um, for PKIA enabled infrastructure or private CAs is the ESS SSL Observatory Project. They actually went out and literally scanned the entire internet on TCB443, wound up reading the certificates and did a whole bunch of filtering on them, and this is the stats that they came back with. Um, so real world examples, anybody here work for SAIC by chance? Okay, nobody's going to admit it. So this is where SAIC falls in the, uh, you know, uh, EFF Observatory. And so I found this actual website here where they publish the CRLs. And the issue that you have here is you have both public and private, in other words, internal SSL certificate revocation was published. So circled in red there, you can see that it's actually using a Microsoft Certificate Authority. So uh, you know for sure that that uh, box that issued that certificate is uh, you know, a Microsoft box. And here you can see that it's actually a, a sub-CA. Um, again, here, down here, you look at the bottom, you'll see that it is the, uh, you know, the URL to get to the actual uh, CRLs. And there's, uh, using uh, Netcraft, there's the actual um, you know, web server and the software and the OS that it runs. Another example uh, is DISA. So if you Google DOD PKI certificate, you get the first hit. And it's the actual uh, site that you go to to request uh, you know, a signed uh, certificate based upon the, uh, you know, the one that you just created. Um, you'll note that the bottom of this page says the site is unclassified for official use only. Uh, after my talk at DerbyCon, there was uh, a couple people that said, hey, this is FOU and uh, you, know, uh, you shouldn't have disclosed this and uh, tried to give me a whole bunch of trouble on it. And I made the argument, hey, it's open to the world, it's open to the internet, anyone can get there. So if you go to the website, this is what you'll wind up seeing. You get a little disclaimer that pops up. So you wind up using the retrieval tab, and then you search for certificates, and you can basically fill out any of those values. So the one that probably is going to be the most useful is the one that says common name. That's where you put the fully qualified uh, domain name. So here's the result. If you put in www.cybercom.mil, you'll get the actual certificate values back. If you search for something like VPN, the only problem with this portal interface is you're limited to 99 uh, results. So you can see here the first one is common name vpntest.nos.bet.ds.af.mil. Um, probably a pretty, pretty good box to target because they call it VPN test. Um, here's another one, if you search based upon organizational unit for NSA, you come back with a couple of hits. This one, first one here happens to be a revoked certificate. There's all kinds of options in here that you can search for when the certificate was issued, when it expires. So um, if you look at it from a the, uh, validity perspective, you could possibly use this because we know all the users normally click yes when a certificate is expired, so you can possibly um, get someone to connect to a website that doesn't have a valid certificate. So other queries that I run in, in the time uh, between uh, DerbyCon and HackerCon are looking for Active Directory, and um, also you get local host results. Uh, possibilities are endless, and that pretty much concludes it. Uh, I need somebody to give me $370,000 so I can register a couple TLDs. You'll notice the O is not an O, it's actually a zero, and the L is a one. Again, my presentation from DerbyCon and HackerCon is out there. Uh, I don't know what it runs. I just saw that it was an absorbent amount of money. I think it's like 185 to do the initial registration. It's, it's per year, and if there's any legal uh, matters, it's going to go half a million dollars. Oh, Lord. Well, I don't have that kind of money, and I doubt they will let me register that money. Yeah. <laughs> so, any other questions? Next up, we're going to have Chris John Riley. Whoa! Step high. Gotcha. Thank you, man. Who is that masked man? So, one of the bombers. 
So one of the things I try to do is I ask each of the speakers to give me the boxing intro. So this is Chris. <laughs> Uh, Sorry, I got this so dirty. Right? Yeah, I grabbed the wrong door. The three times world tweetings. Oh. It's a bit of a bad set, <laughs> I'll admit. Total wins champion and all around media were now hailing from the middle of the middle of nowhere. Oh, man, it's like all braided. He's just this guy, you know. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Chris John Riley. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, let's see if this video feed actually works. Yeah. Please, please be something really, really standard. It's a, it's a Mac. It's, a, it's bound to work. It's a Mac. Oh uh, no! Uh, <laughs> not in my personal experience, my friend. Whatever you do, do not set your Mac on top of that. <laughs> Just a word. All right. Yeah, it looks okay from my perspective. Hey, Brian. Zor. Yeah. Zor. <laughs> is uh, let's see, is uh, Pedro here? Okay, cool. Right. I voted for him. <laughs> <laughs> Pedro for president. And Michelle's here. Okay, we're good. All right, here we go. I'm watching that video feed this morning. <laughs> all the slides get on over and cut them off. Um, well, it's hard to tell with that one. It looks good. One's on. There's another. Oh, it looks good. I think you're good to go, Chris. Like that last one. One, two, three, four. <laughs> God, so, sex, so what you else? you see it, but I don't see it? Love? Yes. Classy. Oh, gotcha. It's going to be really hard to use. Inception. The derby inside of a derby. What you going to do with it? Okay. The new wire? The new wire? It's only like two hot wires going to the tower. There we go. There you go. There we go. Good now. Good now. Everything's in the circuit board, though. Yeah. Uh, if you got started now, you might be screwed with that. And now you can't see it again. Where's the previous speaker? Thomas! Come on, Come on back up. He's going to pelt you. Pull it through. <laughs>
So we're definitely going to talk about today, but we're going to talk a little bit about SAP, we're going to cover the basics, um, what SAP is really quickly, um, a little bit about information is key and how we can get information out of SAP boxes, and a little bit about stock and bought. So, what's what? SAP. Who's ever heard of SAP? No one, right? <laughs> um, so, I mean, everyone has their information in at least one SAP system somewhere. Okay, if you don't think you have, then you're wrong. Sorry. Um, SAP pretty much runs the world. Yeah, SAP is at the heart of most large organizations. So somewhere on the line, your information goes into an SAP box and is archived for life, which is kind of depressing. Um, when I started working with SAP stuff, I still had hair. <laughs> okay, this, this, this is depressing. But I mean, SAP described themselves as this, this big company that holds all of your information. And, but they're right, they're the big company that hold your information. They're a huge company, 120,000 clients worldwide. Um, most people who really know about security of SAP describe them as the biggest repository of information that everyone wants to get. Because why bother scraping information from a thousand sources if you can just hack the SAP box and download it all to your system? So, SAP boxes on pen tests are great, but it's pretty bad. Scary. Is it really that bad? Oh, yes, it's that bad. Um, uh, 2010, um, SAP released at one time 500 security patches. Not bug fixes, actual security patches. 500 at once. Um, I don't have a slide that says that, that they released 900 security patches at the end of 2011 because I couldn't find anyone who got it in the press. <laughs> Video camera in there. <laughs> Not from that direction, you can. Um, so, um, to anyone who hasn't seen a SOAP request, it's, it's a simple XML format. So, you get a post request. The important stuff is the envelope. Okay, so you've got your envelope, you've got all your headers, then you send your interesting stuff. You say what you want. I want the stock price for SAP, which is probably commenting at this very moment. Um, you then get a response. You get the stock price 34.5. Um, simple as that. Okay. Most people are moving to REST interfaces, but SAP are keeping it real. They're 
I'm still using so. So, a little bit about SAP management console. Um, it runs on HTTP or HTTPS. Um, I found a couple of HTTPS systems. I'm sure they were all using self inserts. But um, it can use SSL. Most of the time, it doesn't seem to. Um, but it also uses basic authentication. Um, yeah, it's 2011. So, yeah, it's 2012. <laughs> um, and people are still using basic authentication. Um, but most of the things I'm talking about here aren't even requiring any authentication at all. So it's also enabled by default on every single SAP system by default. So information is key. Okay, we, we want to get information out of this SAP box. So how are we going to get some information out? Um, what's wrong with Nessus scan? Yeah, Nessus is going to help us. Nessus knows everything. So we run a quick Nessus scan on our SAP box, and it tells us that. Oh, there's one low finding with no risk at all. So, let's prove the problem. Okay, let's jump into some Metasploit and let's see whether or not we can prove the problem. This is probably going to fail horribly at this point. Thank <laughs> you. 
<laughs> Shouldn't have stopped on the demo guards. Yeah. Damn those demo builds. Okay. Oh, well, this is probably a brute force, which is taking a little bit longer than I thought. Three minutes. Wow. <laughs> Lip doesn't hold it? Yeah. Oh shit. So so while we're doing a little break here, guys. I know how you doing. Sorry about that. I just wanted to again you know, thank our awesome sponsors. We have Milton Security.
Stand up, Pedro. Wait a minute. Pedro actually has a nice little cool intro. So. You have my vote. All right. So here we go. They say routers killed his parents. A true router beer. The most wanted enemy of the telecom companies in Mexico. Hey. Something, the password we just copied, and it says continue. 
So let's see if it worked. We put admin as the user ID and just paste in the password we have in. And we got in. <laughs> Let's 
try to, let's see if it works. We're going to try to access the same advanced configuration interface and just paste in that password. Click OK. And we're in. <laughs> liability insurance like? <laughs>
the stream. That's, okay. Well, that was recording. Let me make sure this thing's still going. Well, when she hooks that computer up, hopefully it's still recording. And I got an extra recording here going on. Okay. Now, are you having any of the slides at all in your video? Because we're at the synchronize yeah. those. Yeah, with I have the slides, but I just haven't zoomed out. It's such a big picture, I can grab the person out of it. So I can sync it fine. Okay, so you see where the slide transitions have. Yeah, I see cool. where they are. So, yeah, I'll be able to Cool, and I'm getting... I'm, and I'm getting extra live, so, you know, we have backup. Yeah. Though mine looks awfully weird because I'm like looking at people like the Godzilla. Yeah. Or Mothra. Yeah, you know, whatever. Or Mothra. Mothra. Mothra is also monster from Japanese war film. Well, Japanese giant monster film. It's just a monster from Mothra. Okay. You were born after 1984. It's okay. She vlogs and contributes to podcasts on the subject of Japanese security for practical shirts. Which you can find at packetpushers.net. Plug. She also likes long walks, long, 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 long walks in pub sites, traveling to screen conferences, and spending extended hours in the back cave. Sincerely, he believes that every problem can be solved with a fork. Ladies and gentlemen, Mrs. Black. <laughs> Okay, this is going to be a little bit different than probably what most of you are used to. Um, it's not very technical. It's uh, focused mostly on neuroscience. I am, as he said, I'm a senior network security engineer. I work for a financial services provider right now. Um, I contribute to packet pushers. I am not a neuroscientist. Sorry. The problem. We spend thousands, millions, and millions of dollars on tools. Vendors love to sell us tools. DLP, firewalls, IDS, IPS, you name it, management likes to buy it. And what happens? The weakest link is the user. So even with training, and we spend lots of training on for users, they still make the wrong choices. They still click the boxes they're not supposed to click. St they still open documents they're not supposed to open. They go to Facebook, Twitter, they post in confidential information, they use their pet's name as a password. But what if this isn't about users being stupid? We like to believe that, but what if the problem is really us? What if it's the way that we work with the user in trying to make these changes happen? Bring it closer. There you go. Yep. Um, okay, here's a little bit of brain science. I tried to simplify it a lot, so I'm not going to go into a significant detail. But um, you've got three sections. If you make a fist right now with your hand, this is actually a good model of the brain. So this is your spinal cord, your brain stem. Right here, your thumb could be considered your limbic system, which is the emotional center. Um, and then your fingers can be considered the, the cortex. Right here, you can consider that the prefrontal cortex, which is the management center of the brain. The way that you process, for example, a threat response, your cortex is going to take in data, input of some kind, either externally or even internally through your own brain stimulation. Now what's going to happen is your emotional center, your limbic system, and your prefrontal cortex are going to take this information in at the same time. But your limbic system is fast. That's from evolution. It's determining threat right away. Oh, is that a tiger? I better run. But the prefrontal cortex is the tortoise. No, I'm going to take my time. I've got to figure out what's really going on here. It's going to do the analysis. But the limbic system's already done. The amygdala, which is the key component of the limbic system is sort of like the alarm. And it's deciding right then and there, within a few seconds, do I need to set off a stress response? Now the reason I'm telling you all this is because, A, one of the most important things that you have to understand is the limbic system is an open loop. It's highly influenced because we are social beings. 
Your limbic system, my limbic system, are influenced by other people in, in propinquity to you. So, for example, have you ever noticed that when somebody's in a bad mood and comes to work, that you don't want to be around them? Because they're going to make you feel bad. Or if somebody's happy and they're around you, you want to be around them. That's because of this limbic system of the blue. The brain, because the limbic system is, is faster than the prefrontal cortex, has a negativity bias. Traumatic experiences are stickier than happy experiences. And why this is important is that you're going to be in situations where you're not going to realize that you set off a threat response in somebody else or they're under the effect of a threat response. For example, in a meeting, traffic was bad. You're working with users. You have an assessment. They're pissed off because they've been in traffic and their threat response is up. And you're trying to talk to them and you're asking for their help. And what are they gonna say? You're perceived as additional threat. So they're gonna be resistant to you. And that's what you're probably noticing a lot of times. It's not just the information that you present, but how you present it to them. So some of the common things that, that will help you recognize an amygdala hijack in yourself, for example, is have you ever noticed out of the corner of your eye, you look and you think it's a threat and you know it's a shadow or something, and you think maybe it's somebody coming to attack you and it's just, it, it was just imagination. You know, one of the common things is you see a stick on the ground and you thought it was a snake in the grass, but it, it was just a stick. But your prefrontal cortex has to figure that out about a minute, two minutes later after your limbic system. One common example of uh, this kind of quick response by the limbic system is called thin slicing. Um, <laughs> Warren Harding, for example, commonly recognized as one of the most mediocre or worst presidents that the United States has ever had. But he was good looking, he was personable, he was tall, he was, you know, everybody thought, wow, I really like him. So they voted for him. And they got a word that really bad president. The way we present information is going to decide how we are accepted within an organization, whether our changes are accepted, and whether we are going to be perceived with affinity or as threat. So when you go to your next meeting, or when you present your next assessment, I'd like all of you to consider, for example, you know, you're tired, <laughs> you know, um, I think your haircut's really cool, for example. I like the mohawk <laughs> that's going on there. But if you walk into Bank of America, you know, and they're all wearing suits and ties, you know, they're going to, human nature is that we're very tribal, we're looking for affinity, and they're going to think, ooh, he's not like me, threat, threat. And so when you present your assessment, I mean, no offense, they're going to say, yeah, I don't know. He doesn't look like us. I don't know who that guy is. I mean, that's just the way the human brain works. So what does work? If we know that training has failed with users, and we know that there's this open loop, we know that uh, people make intuition and, and, and gut decisions based on very little information, one thing that has been shown to work is a dynamic feedback loop. Um, in the 60s, they discovered that uh, giving individuals a clear goal and a method of evaluating progress increased the likelihood that they would achieve it. And I know that doesn't really mean anything, but think about, you know those digital speeding signs? In California, they did a study, and these signs were shown to be more effective than actually writing tickets. Why? Because you're going down the street, you see a sign that says the speed limit is 25 miles per hour. Then you see, oh, I'm doing 34. Well, everybody else can see me doing 34 miles per hour, too. God. And it's a school zone. That's embarrassing. That's why it works. 
And they've shown that it's effective and has reduced on speeds on the average of 10%. And sometimes they saw that people were going even slower than the advertised speed limit. So what if we could use something like this in security training? If we could give dynamic feedback to the user without fear of punishment and just giving them an idea of how effective they were, you know, or what decisions they were making and how dangerous those decisions were. What else works? Social and emotional intelligence. The key competencies of these skills, uh, empathy, self-awareness, self-regulation, conflict management, collaboration, leadership, these are highly effective tools. If you guys are only going to, to technical courses and you're not taking communications classes, if you're not including that in your professional development, I encourage you. This will be very helpful to you in overcoming resistance. So I'd like all of you to think now about when, when you go to your next meeting, when you have your next interaction with somebody who's not your team, I'd like you to notice how you may be inciting a threat response in them, how you may be encountering resistance to change, which in fact is just them going through threat response. Can you notice an amygdala hijack in yourself? You're in traffic, you're waiting in line, you're getting frustrated. Um, you know, you had an argument with your partner. I mean, you're in threat response and then you yell at somebody else. So I'd like to thank, I, I did vet this with um, you know, a psychologist and a PhD in uh, neuroscience. And I also use books by, and I encourage you to, to use these books by Dan Siegel, Dan Goldman, and Rick Hansen. Um, I'm a member of uh, Packet Pushers. You can find us on the web. Um, I encourage you to uh, also, if you'd like to blog and you haven't blogged before, I encourage you to apply to Packet Pushers and become a blogger. We'd love to have you. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs>
we got the time to make stuff, so we already have one more talk. David Zanzian is going to be doing his talk. Uh, he was originally scheduled first, but yeah, with all the confusion with the timing. Um, so, Mike, so don't leave after my talk. And, um, okay, so we're going to go here. I have this glow in the dark keyboard stickers. Oh! All right. <laughs> Wait. Right. That one. This is very light. That this one. Is very light. <laughs> Fix your own fucking computer. Passenger name. 
So this guy's talking on the phone, and I'm only hearing one side of his conversation, but I get the idea from the conversation that he's a minister. So I was like, okay, and I looked at his name. So I was like, okay, let's see, see what I can find out about this guy in like two minutes on the phone. Well, this was him. The guy's name is Eric Holder, which is, he wasn't the attorney general, but that was his name. And I, 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 I Googled him, I found a picture, and I was like, that's him. And his whole biography was on the internet. I found that out in two minutes by looking at his past. So think about that. So it's a table, right? This is a table that I wanted to get rid of. So I put it on free cycle. And someone said, hey, we'll, we'll come do that. So afterwards, I realized, hmm. Did, they really, did I really need to tell them where my address was? So I looked at them because I used my phone to take a picture of it. Even though my GPS is off, the exit data on the thing <coughs> showed that this table was sitting in my front yard. So this is innocent ignorance. Even though my GPS was off, I didn't realize that my phone was still tagging the exact GPS location of, of the tape of where I took the picture. I mean, think about that. We're consumers, so like we want to know everything. We watch these investigative reports, right? Big, when we had a TV show called Big Brother, right? People watch this. You know, we want to know about people. We want to see people, you know, doing, you know. Jersey Shore. Yeah, I mean, you know, all these things, we, we want this stuff. So because we want it, someone's going to go get it for us. There's a quote from Aristotle. Basically says, human beings exist because they want to, you know, associate with other people. Right? Go on to uh, Bing, they have a thing called Map Apps, Twitter, this is today, or the last couple days, geolocated geo tweets around the hotel. You can click on them and see who they are, what they're talking about. You guys use those exercise things that like tell you how you, you know, tweet put it on the internet, where you're, where you're driving your bike, where you're, you're jogging. This guy put his, like, um, his jog online, and it went on to Google Maps, and you could find out one place was listed as his home, one place was listed as his place of work. I mean, people put this stuff online. I'm not saying you can't. Um, so people who ride the Metro here in DC, there's a thing called the Smart Trip Card. Records your, uh, every time you go from one place to another. So this guy took all his Smart Trip data and mapped it. So this basically says, these are the stations that he's coming and going to. So obviously, Silver Spring, is probably where he lives and goes all these other places. But this data that, I mean, it's not publicly available, but if you get your hands on this data, you'll learn a lot about someone. Who's got an easy pass or some other sort of device that, uh, yeah. Who's got, a, who's got a customer, who's got a, a, a loyalty card with a business where like, you give them the card? There's a firefighter in Temple of Washington who was arrested because uh, his Safeway club card showed that he bought this certain type of fire fire starter that was used, uh, the same type, same type that was used to start a fire, so he was arrested for it. Turns out that someone else confessed to the crime, and it turns out that they didn't need a warrant to even get the data because he had willingly turned it over to, to Safeway. Who's got a Hilton Honors card? Yeah. Third party doctrine basically says that once you share your information with someone else, you give it to a company or business, you have no expectation of privacy in that information anymore. So the police don't even, typically don't even need a warrant for that information. Easy pass all over the East Coast, fast track, yeah. Quick question, is, that, is it just the information you give officially signed up for? All your information. Anything that's collected, typically. They just opened up a new road in Maryland. Uh, ICC, Intercounty Connector, anybody drive one yet? Interconnected connector is easy pass only, right? You have to have an easy pass, and if you don't, they take a picture of your car and they send you send you a ticket or send you a, a bill in the mail, and it's 150 percent of of the of the fee. So they charge you more to not use easy pass. I mean, they're basically forcing you to do. You don't have to, but they're forcing you to do. Uh, GPS providers have sold data to the police, and then they use that data to set up traps. Anybody have one of these? Progressive Snapshot or Allstate DriveWise? You put these things, attach these things into your car, and you can save 30% of your insurance when you give them this data because they're going to find out you're not an aggressive driver. <laughs> what are they recording? All sorts of things accelerations, speeding, uh, GPS locations. They're recording everything you're doing, right? 
Do you, is, it, is it worth it? Acquiescence. Acquiescence is the most important one because this is where we know about something and we still don't care about it. So like the, the, scan, the naked scanner, which the court said so far it said, okay, it's constitutional. So we say, oh, okay, it's constitutional, I'll do it. Acquiescence, the way to fight it is to say, just because it's constitutional doesn't mean we should fight against it. We saw Senator Rand Paul um, went through the machine uh, this past weekend and it, it hit on him and he said and they wanted to give him a pat down. He's like, no, I'm not getting the pat down. And they, they eventually escorted him out of the airport. And people were saying, well, he needs to be treated like everyone else. Well, of course he was treated like everyone else. They didn't let him fly, they kicked him out. But he's making, he, it wasn't, the scene was not about him. He's making a stand, he's making a you know, stand about what's going on. So, uh, the Metro here in DC started random bag searches. I mean, random bag searches. You don't have to be a suspect, they're just going to search your bag. Anybody hear about Viper teams? So the DHS and the agencies called the Viper teams, they go around and they like random inspections. Now they're doing it on interstate highways, random stops on highways, no suspicion. How much time do I have? How much time? Okay. How about all this? How about all this surveillance around? Um, a lot of time, a lot of uh, communities install these red light speed cameras. So you know, if you go through a red light, it takes your picture. Well, now. They take pictures while you're sitting at the intersection, and if your car is six inches over the yellow, uh, over the white line, you know, in the box, they'll give you a ticket for that. Yeah, this is uh, this is actually a report that the ACLU of Illinois did on surveillance cameras in Chicago. It's really good. Okay, so the whole thing here is called reasonable expectation of privacy. Reasonable is probably the most litigated word in in, in the English language, and the reason is reasonable by nature is a subjective term. There's two parts to this test. One is an actual objective uh, expectation of privacy. In other words, you and you know, you go into a phone booth and you close the door and you hold your hand over the mouthpiece, you, you have an expectation of privacy. The second piece is very subjective, and that is that society says that your expectation of privacy is reasonable. So it's sort of a loop, but you know, but both of these things are variables, right? We can change them. So you go into a phone booth, you close the door, you cover your, you know, you, you're speaking with a very low voice. Not only do you have a reasonable expectation of privacy, but people will generally say, yes, you do. What about you walking around in a public park? Do you have a reasonable expectation of privacy? No, not really. What about in your home? Well, yeah, in your home you do. What about when you put your trash out on the curb? Well, once you take it to the curb, you, you're basically saying, I'm ready for someone to pick it up if you have no expectation of privacy. What about in a backpack? When something's in a container, generally you have a reasonable expectation of privacy. What about these clear backpacks that they make kids use in school? Mm -hmm. Now you can see why there's a lot of litigation about the Fourth Amendment. What about social media? Sharing information, putting all this stuff out there. I'm not saying you should share information, but think about the consequences of it. So he, I, I don't code, but here's my reasonable expectation of privacy. Both variables have to be true, okay? That's basically what I'm saying here. Here's your key takeaways. If you have an expectation of privacy and society finds that expectation to be reasonable, um, then you actually have a reasonable expectation of privacy. The fourth amendment applies. Um, if either variable is false, once you put something out there, once you put your once you put your trash out to the curb, you're saying I'm ready for someone to take it away. You've lost that expectation. Um, both variable, both are they are they're, they are variables. So you have to do something about it, right? How many people are flying out of here? tomorrow or next day or somewhere. <laughs> you know, most people, most people don't want to make a scene at the airport because you have to get home, you're either going on business, you're going on vacation. But you know, when I left uh, Las Vegas uh, the day, uh, Monday after death, um, uh, I, was, I was the second person into the checkpoint. And the guy in front of me opted out, I opted out, the guy behind me opted out, and they were already getting frustrated. Like they just opened the gates. And the fourth guy opted out, and she started, she called for a supervisor. And then he acquiesced, then he was like, you know what, I don't want to cause a scene. And
But think about it. I mean, there were reports that on set, there were there there were some anecdotal reports that on set, uh, Sunday and Monday on DEF CON that 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 the TSA in Las Vegas had seen far more opt outs than they had ever seen. Right? It doesn't require everyone to do it, but think about they say one they say on average one percent of people opt out. What if ten percent did? I mean, think about the impact of that. If one percent of people do something, what's the expectation? Well, what about if ten percent do or twenty percent? So anyway, most of us are pretty good about this, most of the time. But sometimes we're not. I posted a picture of GPS today, I didn't even think about it. So most of us are pretty good about this. It's important for us to take responsibility for educating other people. Because most people out there don't care. Most of the people are in that ignorance category. They don't know. So it's our job to change it. Thank you very much. You know, it probably got on the audio in this video, right? Yeah. Just, 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 just letting you know, bud. <laughs> That's an Easter egg from hell. Uh, how do you know your code is inside your cabinet 
Let's pull the water into the UTC. David. What? If I didn't start first, it's full now. So, no pressure, no pressure. So I'll go through this quickly so we can enjoy it and move the microphone. Um, a little bit myself. David, MZ is the magic name, so yes, I am DMZ. Probably the only actor has a real name that business society work in. I am a Southern hacker. I live in South Carolina. So for those from the South, we're here, we're not going away. Uh, I'm a managing partner with the servers. Come on down and visit us. We've got a table down here. We have to tell you what we all do. And I'm no longer a QSA. Yeah! I'm a huge operational security advocate. Uh, well, it's always fun to hear zero days, lots of the exploits. How do you live with it? That's what I live in. I want to advocate that. And I am the, uh, one of the founders of hopefully the soon to come B Sides in Charleston. So for those of you who want to come down and enjoy some good southern barbecue and a real coast of steak, come on down. We'll get that as soon as possible. So, what I'm talking about, something really simple. We'll get layer one, the physical side. Even more than ever, because I just want to use a good example. Physical is something that everyone has and got to take care of. Because, you know, we all put our security into nice data centers. And we all know they're secure, right? No one can break into a data center. You can't get in there. Look at him, he has a nice hat. He thinks it's really cool. You, you want to be a cop one day, if you didn't work out, you kicked out of that. So now he's a security guard in your data center. You know he's watching your shit, right? Okay, so they got past the data center guard. Your cabinets are locked, right? You're safe. You can't get through that. Yeah, not really, no. So what I've done here, and I've made a little, little device. <laughs> Anyone here um, probably has seen all the hacking we were playing with, the TC device, trying to do keyboard hacking. And it's a really cool device. You can do a lot of things with it. I've actually taken it to a more practical approach. I've taken a TNC, use a simple uh, a loop interface, and actually just monitor various things around it. So right now you can hook up to door sensor alarms, you can proximity alarms, whatever you want to have in your environment. Simple little device, plug it together, and we can actually use it for something useful. Not that hacking isn't useful, but I want to be helpful to people. Uh, how does it actually work? There's actually two sides to it. There's a firmware on the TNC itself, and there's a software. I'll go through a couple of those things quickly. We've only got about 10 to 15 minutes, so I'll jump, I'll jump through it and you can, uh, see what we can do with it. The firmware is really simple. Anyone who's programmed on TC, it just sits there. It's a looping device. It just loops over and over and over again. And all I'm doing is I'm taking the status of the inputs. The other side of the software is serial device. I'm just opening a serial port saying, hey, is this port open? Is this port closed? Nothing more complex than that. Works great for a $16 device. So, oh, I forgot my demo down there. So I'll show you a pretty picture here. Um, the whole idea was sponsored by this because fun scenes coming up here. No copyrights, no lawyers here. Um, I was always inspired by you, the idea that it's fun breaking in. I love doing pen testing, I'm you know, getting away with it. But that one breach right there, no one's watching that. No one ever watches that security part. So when somebody actually gets in there, boom, they read your box. Nothing you can do about it because you had no idea about it. That's really the core of what I wanted to make here. Uh, how does it actually work? It's really, as I said, it's really, really, really simple. The design itself, simple loops. TNC has, on this small model, 23 inputs, digital and analog. So you can actually do a lot more with them than what I'm doing. The analog input is really sensitive. You can hook up humidity sensors, you know, temperature sensors. You can put extra LEDs and scatter them throughout your cabinet just confuse people with blinking lights. Whatever you want to do with it, it's really simple that way. I'm just doing the simplest of all designs, checking and says, is this, is this loop closed, is the port closed, is it, open, is it open or whatever. Uh, the firmware itself, again, it says extremely simple. It initializes itself, sets all the dot on interfaces. Um, and on, on the TC itself, there's a lot of ways you can program the pins, or they pin up, pin down, all those various things. And all it does is loops forever, forever and ever. And all it's doing through that, throughout the entire process, reading the status, saying, hey, is anybody asking for anything? If so, submit it back. Hey, is there an alert? What's a blink of light? Tell someone about it. Not even more fun than that. Uh, on the Linux side, and this could be done on Linux or Windows, I did Linux because it's probably the easiest thing to do it. It's a very simple serial program. We open up the serial port, say, hey, any status going on? Tell me what's going on port one. Comes back and says, hey, port one's available, it's open, it's closed, whatever it might be. Oh, I have to keep up 15 minutes. Hey, you get out of here early, guys. So, I, I hate to you know, try to spread this out and make it a 15 minute talk, and now it's only been five minutes, but there's a big rush to try to get end of the day here. I want to really just you know, talk to you about it and show you that. It's a really simple tool that everyone is using for hacking devices, using it for SAT, using it for all these, these really cool attacking things. It can also be used for a defensive posture. So you can actually get a view inside your cabinet, see what's going in there, and more than just attackers. You know, you can actually use it for operational roles and say, we have a change window, it's during this time frame, who's doing what with the cabinet, making sure you actually have a view into the actual environment of your data centers. So I know I ran through it in six minutes. 